Muy buenas tardes, tengan todas y todos ustedes. Sean bienvenidos a la conferencia de clausura de este trigésimo Foro Nacional de Investigación en Salud. Vamos a cerrar nuestro programa académico con una conferencia a cargo de la doctora Cynthia Dunbar, quien es investigadora del Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Cardíacas, Pulmonares y Hematológicas de los Institutos Nacionales de Salud de los Estados Unidos. La conferencia de la doctora Dunbar se titula la terapia génica alcanza la mayoría de edad. La doctora Dunbar realizó sus estudios de licenciatura en ciencias en la Universidad de Harvard. Posteriormente, en esa misma universidad, hizo el doctorado en medicina. Desde 1991 es investigadora principal en los Institutos Nacionales de Salud de los Estados Unidos. Desde el año 2000 es la jefa del Laboratorio de Hematopoiesis Molecular en el Instituto Nacional de, de Salud de los Estados Unidos y desde el año 2010 es la jefa de la sección de investigación traslacional en hematología. Ella ha sido editor en jefe de la revista Blood, cuyo factor de impacto supera los 22 puntos. Eh, fue presidenta de la American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy y al día de hoy tiene casi 300 artículos publicados. Sus trabajos han sido citados en más de 30.000 ocasiones y su índice H es 81. Ella trabaja tanto en aspectos biomédicos como clínicos de las enfermedades hematológicas y tiene fundamentalmente tres líneas de investigación. Por un lado, la biología molecular de la hematopoyesis, por otro lado, la terapia génica de enfermedades hematológicas y finalmente ensayos clínicos en donde prueba nuevos fármacos hematológicos y terapias génicas y celulares. Los dejo entonces en compañía de la doctora Dunbar, a quien le agradecemos profundamente su participación en este evento. Hello, my name is Cindy Dunbar, and I'd like to thank Dr. Mayani for inviting me to speak to you today. I'd much rather be in Mexico City in person. I had a wonderful trip to your city in 2019, just before the pandemic began, and enjoyed the museums, the jacaranda, and the incredible food. So I'm going to talk to you today um, about gene therapies, specifically targeting blood diseases. A lot has happened in the last 30 years, um, many challenges, many hurdles that we've had to overcome, and quite a few successes as well. So I'd like to start with a case, um, because I am a physician, as many of you are. Um, and this is a 34-year-old man who has severe hemophilia B. That's factor IX deficient hemophilia. His activity is 1%. He gets factor IX prophylaxis, but he still has bleeds. Um, this causes him to miss work. He's socially disengaged and depressed. He has no factor IX inhibitor. He has no liver disease. And he comes in with an acute bleed after tripping on the sidewalk. And you can see how his right knee is warm, swollen, um, tender, and he has atrophy of quadriceps muscles on both sides due to repeated bleeds. Now, supporting this kind of patient in terms of prophylactic factor as well as on demand is something close to $400,000 a year in the United States. So if he lives till 50, this could uh, result in up to $15 million of charges to the healthcare system, the insurance company, or the patient himself. So uh, there's a number of different concepts I'm going to go through first in terms of gene addition and gene therapies. Now, gene addition is when we use an uh, integrating lentivirus, so-called gene therapy vector, a virus that's been modified to uh, get into target cells, such as hematopoietic stem cells. In the case of gene addition, we have a mutation shown here in red that could be on one chromosome, and we have an integrating lentivirus that enters a cell and inserts a therapeutic gene semi-randomly into the chroma chromatin. So here we show it in green on a different chromosome. Another type of gene therapy vector that's been used quite extensively are adenoviruses or adeno-associated viruses, and they actually stay episomal, so they pot potentially could infect, say, a liver cell, as I've shown here. The mutation, say, in a factor IX gene is on one chromosome, 
Um, but these uh, small viruses stay episomally, and in the case of AAV, can express their transgene product for years um, in this episomal form. However, if the cell divides, um, the gene is not passed on to daughter cells. It's eventually diluted out. And then towards the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about targeted gene correction or targeted gene addition. And this is using gene editing, such as the CRISPR-Cas9. So in this case, you actually target um, your gene therapy to the specific part of the chromosome that's mutated or a specific location that you want to target. And you actually can replace the mutated gene, as I've shown here in green. Um, in terms of how we approach gene therapies in patients, there's two major approaches. One is ex vivo gene therapy, um, where genes are introduced or edited in cells outside the body and then returned to the patient. So for instance, T cells for CAR T therapies or hematopoietic stem cells, as I'm going to talk about today to treat sickle cell anemia or immunodeficiency disorders, are collected from the patient exposed to the gene therapy vector, such as a virus in culture, and then the cells are reinfused intravenously. They engraft in the bone marrow and they make the gene product, presumably for the rest of the life of the patient. In vivo gene therapies are when we're trying to target organs that cannot be taken outside the body and manipulated. For instance, liver, muscle, brain, or heart. And in this case, gene therapy vectors such as adeno-associated virus are injected intravenously or injected directly into the target organ to uh, undergo um, uh, introduction into cells of interest and eventual production of the transgene and reversal of the phenotype. So if you're a hematologist, you've seen um, these diagrams of hematopoiesis with the top, a self-renewing hematopoietic stem cell, making daughter cells for the life of the individual, going through progenitor cells, precursor cells, and then a variety of mature cells in the immune system, T and B cells, dendritic cells, red blood cells, um, granulocytes and monocytes. And you can see here, I've listed a number of the different disorders that have been approached with hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy, including stem cell disorders such as Fanconi anemia, red cell disorders such as thalassemia and sickle cell anemia that I'll talk about later, a large variety of immune cell disorders, and even metabolic or processing disorders um, involving macrophages, such as adrenal leukodystrophy or metachromatic leukodystrophy that affect the, the brain and the nervous system. Now, I, I wrote a review about three years ago that Dr. Mayani, I think, um, was interested in and uh, hoped that I could focus on some of the um, aspects that I went over in that review. And in that review, I had a number of different timelines for gene therapies. And this is specifically looking at hematopoietic stem cell gene therapies. And the point of this is that we're really 30 years or more of research into target cells, understanding hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, understanding viruses that could be used as vectors to introduce new genes into cells, a lot of preclinical data in mice and eventually in non-human primates and looking at human cells and culture before we went ahead and were able to achieve hematopoietic stem cell gene therapies. Early studies were very frustrating as I'll talk about. And then in the last 10 years, we've really uh, gotten much more efficient at this type of gene therapy. So I need to describe integrating viral vectors that are used to um, correct or transduce hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. You have a wild type viral RNA genome for a retrovirus, such as a murine retrovirus, or a lentivirus, such as an HIV uh, virus. You take out the viral genes that you know, potentially could be toxic, for instance, an HIV, and replace them with your therapeutic gene but you leave in place what are called the long terminal repeats at each end of the viral genome. And you also leave in place a packaging signal. And this allows you to take this vector genome and supply gag pollen envelope genes in trans from say a plasmid or a producer cell line as I show you that can package this vector release it um, from the packaging cell and infect a target cell. And that's what I show here. So we take our vector, we put it into this packaging cell line or little vector factory, 
It is packaged with gag pollen envelope proteins that are being produced by that cell. It's released from the packaging cell line. We can collect it in culture media. We can concentrate it. We can purify it. And then we take our target hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells in culture, expose them to the viral vector, which binds to a specific receptor on the surface. It uncoats inside the cell, undergoes reverse transcription, and then uses the long terminal repeats and the typical life cycle of a, a integrating retrovirus to integrate into the host cell chromosome semi-randomly. Now, the early vectors that were used called MLV or murine um, leukemia virus vectors can't transduce quiescent stem cells because stem cells in the stem cells are the most primitive stem cells are often not dividing and the nuclear membrane, they can't cross it. But lentiviral vectors based on HIV can cross the nuclear membrane and transduce non-cycling hematopoietic stem cells. So the difference in efficiency between the early MLV vectors and the more recent lentiviral vectors was really striking. In the clinical trial design for all ex vivo hematopoietic stem cell gene therapies over the last uh, approximately 25 years include collecting hematopoietic stem cells either from the marrow or by HSPC mobilization with GCSF or other mobilizing agents, purification of your target cells by positive selection for CD34, because you don't want to actually transduce mature red cells or lymphocytes or other cells that are not going to engraft long term. You then, um, it, you then expose these CD34 positive cells to the vector in culture for two to four days. And then during this time, the patient can get conditioned with busulfan or other potential conditioning agents to basically clear out the bone marrow of endogenous stem cells so your transduced genetically modified cells can engraft. And then you can follow up the patient for level of genetic modification and hopefully a therapeutic effect. So the first generation of hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy trials occurred in the 1990s. They used these murine retroviruses, as I've mentioned, that were not very efficient at transducing true primitive long-term stem cells. A variety of target diseases were approached. And basically, um, myself and others who were working in the field at that time um, showed very low levels of vector-containing cells present in these patients long-term and really no strong evidence for clinical efficacy. They just weren't efficient enough. And one problem is that we really didn't understand the target cell biology of hematopoietic stem cells. We weren't very good at keeping them alive or getting them to cycle outside the body during transduction. And so new cytokines were purified and identified such as thrombopoietin, FLT3 ligand, and stem cell factor, and we got much better ex vivo culture conditions for hematopoietic stem cells, allowing them to be transduced with the viral vectors and reinfused, but still maintain their self renewal capacity. The other issue was we didn't have really very good predictive models. Um, murine models turned out to not be predictive. Murine hematopoietic stem cells behave quite differently, um, and they're much easier to transduce the viral vectors. And in vitro models with human cells were not predictive. So we and others developed non-human primate models and xenograft models that have been much more predictive. Um, so the second generation of gene therapy trials began in the early 2000s. And most of these focused on gene therapy for X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency disorders. And these children have basically no immune system because they're missing um, the signaling um, comp the signaling. Um, domain of the IL-2 receptor called the IL-2 receptor gamma. And this IL-2 receptor gamma also signals for a number of other cytokines important in T cell and NK cell development, and also for development of normal B cell immunity. These children die in early childhood without allotransplantation, and they have many complications from allotransplantation because they're often infected by the time they go undergo transplant. So in these early trials, MLV vectors were used. No conditioning was given because the thought was, and it turned out to be true, that they had a pretty empty uh, T and NK cell compartment, and these cells would expand into this empty compartment and not need conditioning. So simply by improving transduction conditions over the earlier trials, nine of 11 of the original patients in this trial published in Science in 2000 showed normalization of their T cell counts shown here. They had functional, both adaptive and humoral immunity, and they really were able to resume their normal lives, undergo childhood vaccinations, go to school, et cetera. So this was really the first clear clinical benefit of any gene therapy um, since the, the field uh, began. Unfortunately, several years later, 
um, two of the patients began to have a rising T cell count, and it was actually found that they had circulating um, lymphoblasts um, uh, shown here uh, and described in the paper in 2003. And over time, several more patients with XSCID, CGD, and Wiscott Aldrich syndrome that also received stem cells transduced with these MLV vectors also developed uh, T cell leukemias or myelo myeloid leukemias. And in these patients, it was found that they had activation of proto-oncogenes by the semi-random integration of the gene transfer vectors. These gene transfer vectors have very strong promoters and enhancers to drive expression of the uh, therapeutic transgene, but they can also turn on expression of proto-oncogenes that are nearby. And in these first two patients, they activated a transcription factor called LMO2 that's normally turned off during T cell development. By turning it back on, it was a step towards full-blown leukemia, which these patients eventually developed. Um, so the next decade in the uh, teens, it was really a focus on keeping efficacy high, but reducing this genotoxicity. And the way this was done was primarily developing and using HIV-based lentiviral vectors instead of the murine MLV vectors. First of all, these lentiviruses had what appeared to be a safer integration pattern um, because they, they, they integrated over the entire length of, um, uh, of um, express portions of genes in the, um, in the genome, uh, whereas murine retroviruses generally targeted um, promoters. And by targeting promoters, they are more likely to turn on adjacent genes. The other thing, as I've mentioned, that made a huge difference is these HIV-based lentiviral vectors were much more efficient at transducing quiescent hematopoietic uh, stem cells. So using predictive large animal models, uh, such as macaques, safer integration patterns of lentiviruses were uh, documented, as well as lack of any clonal expansions that you would expect would occur before full-blown leukemia. So these lentiviral vectors went back into clinical trials and have showed quite uh, striking success in a number of applications. Um, so I'm going to talk about gene therapies for hemoglobinopathies, which has been really one of the major applications of lentiviral gene therapies in the last 10 years. So the idea is to add back anti-cycling hemoglobin to counteract um, hemoglobin S or to replace missing beta chains in beta thalassemia. You can do this either with natural fetal hemoglobin, hemoglobin F, because we know that has anti-cycling characteristics, or um, another group of investigators um, and a biotech company uh, called Bluebird engineered an anti-cycling beta globin where they made a one base pair change, amino acid change in a regular uh, a beta hemo adult hemoglobin that was anti-cycling. Um, now, sickle cell gene therapy does require very high efficiency transduction of hematopoietic stem cells because we know that at least 20 to 30 percent of stem cells must be um, anti-cycling in order to have an impact. We know that from allogeneic mixed chimeras. You also need a very high level of expression of the anti-cycling hemoglobin per erythroid cell to counteract the hemoglobin S that's still present in the cell. This is not as big a problem for thalassemia, but if you don't have enough beta-like hemoglobin expressed, the alpha chains um, will uh, still precipitate out and cause ineffective erythropoiesis. The other advance that was necessary to approach uh, sickle cell disease was figuring out a safe way to collect sufficient numbers of hematopoietic stem cells for um, gene therapies. And you know, mobilization with GCSF has been found to induce severe crises in sickle cell patients. So instead, a pleurixophore has been shown to be safe in these patients, a very rapid induction of release of hematopoietic stem cells from the marrow into the blood where they can be collected. So by making a number of changes in these sickle cell gene therapy protocols over time, um, the results have greatly improved. And most recently, 14 of 14 patients in an optimized third, third cohort of patients in the Bluebird sickle cell disease trial have high level production of anti-cycling globin, lack of cycling, and markedly decreased pain crises. This has not yet been published, but has been presented a number of times at ASH and the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy meetings by John Tim Tisdale, the senior investigator and a colleague of mine at the National Institutes of Health. 
It's also been shown to have uh, a really profound impact on patients and their quality of life. One of the patients shown here was interviewed on the American TV show 60 Minutes um, back in 2019, talking about what a huge difference um, this approach to treatment has made for her. As well as in sickle cell disease, there's also very promising results in patients with beta thalassemia who um, have achieved either complete or partial transfusion independence as reported by Alexis Thompson in the New England Journal in 2019. Um, but unfortunately, it's a little bit uh, similar to what we experienced with XSCID uh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, we've started to see some adverse events potentially related to genotoxicity. Now, sickle cell disease patients have been noted over the past uh, five to 10 years um, in epidemiologic studies to have a higher incidence of MDS and AML than um, uh, African-American patients that don't have sickle cell disease. And there's a theory that sickle cell marrow damage from repeated sickling events and ischemic um, infarcts of the marrow, as well as damage due to repeated cycling in response to chronic inflammation and ischemia can actually impact on the health of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells and actually cause those cells to prematurely age. So three patients with sickle cell disease have been reported to have developed MDS or AML post-transplantation or post-gene therapy at the NIH. Two were following rejection of an allogeneic transplant from a haplomatched donor. And Courtney Fitzhugh, an investigator at the NIH, found that the P53 mutation that was in the leukemia was already present at much lower levels pre-transplantation. And the idea is the stress of the transplant, rejection of the allograft, and then having to reconstitute hematopoiesis um, from the damaged um, endogenous recipient cells um, predisposed to this leukemia, especially since this patient, these patients already had P53 mutated hematopoietic mm -hmm. stem cells. One gene therapy patient at the NIH was also found to have MDS AML, but the vector was not present in the leukemic cells. So again, it was attributed potentially to the underlying premature aging defect in these patients, as well as the stress of transplantation, going through busulfan conditioning and recovery. But more recently, one patient was in an early cohort of the sickle cell lentiviral gene therapy trial run by Blueboard several years after he was originally infused with vector-containing cells, um, this patient developed MDS-AML. The vector insertion in the leukemic blast was found to be in the VAMP4 gene, which has never been associated with cancer. And no one, you know, there's no evidence that actually activation of this gene had anything to do with this patient's uh, phenotype. However, potentially insertions can have very long range, long range effects on gene expression. And this uh, is, is being worked out. This work has not yet been published. The patient's leukemic cells also had RUNX1 and other typical leukemia or aging mutations. So again, it, the thought has been that maybe the stress of busulfan conditioning, ex vivo culture of cells, proliferation post-transplantation, um, you know, was really the major issue in these sickle cell disease patients versus actual insertional mutagenesis from the gene therapy vector. The other clinical disorders that have been treated successfully uh, to date with lentiviral gene therapy include X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy and metachromatic leukodystrophy. These are both catastrophic um, congenital genetic disorders due to the inability to process um, uh, various components of cell membranes and cells in the central nervous system. In both of them, you end up with um, dysfunction of glial cells, demyelination, and white matter disease. And shown here in the column on the right is a brain of a, a patient um, at, at one year of age and by two years of age, very, very severe um, white matter disease and fatal um, um, with inability to, to speak or walk or function um, before dying in early childhood. Um, and so gene therapy in both of these disorders with lentiviral vectors targeting hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells has allowed um, basically replacement of these uh, dysfunctional uh, brain and CNS macrophages that are unable to process um, these compounds normally. And you see here on the left, um, much less white matter disease over time after gene therapies. And these children have been shown to the majority to do um, much better over time with uh, much better uh, functional abilities and lack of disease onset or progression. 
Similarly, encouraging results of insulin and immunodeficiency disorders with lentiviral vectors such as XSKID, Wiscott Aldrich, and chronic granulomatous disease. However, it's important to, again to remember that the risk for clonal expansion and transformation due to genotoxicity never is zero with any integrating vector. And in fact, one patient in the adrenal leukodystrophy trial was just in the last month announced to have developed a vector associated with leukemia. Don't know yet what gene it was in, don't yet know anything else about the patient, but this has been reported by the company um, in the press. So, you know, it, it's not all underlying um, genetic damage to sickle cell marrow that predisposes to this. Clearly, even normal marrow, such as you would have in adrenal leukodystrophy, is also at risk um, with these semi random integrating vectors. So, the next thing I'm going to talk about is in vivo gene therapy, this time for hemophilia using AAV vectors. And this is another timeline. I'm not going to go through all the details, um, but basically, a lot of advances in virology and in understanding hemophilia and in manufacturing of vectors was necessary before we could have um, success in treatment of these patients. Now, adeno associated viruses are non pathogenic, small, single stranded DNA parvoviruses. They persist is a non-integrated episome in cells. They stably express, express transgenes in these non-dividing cells for many, many years. They're particularly good at um, transducing hepatocytes, muscle cells, neurons, retinal cells, and other CNS targets. And it's important to stress that they have never been shown to be pathogenic. And there are many, many different pseudotypes or strains excuse me, different strains of AAV, and many of us have been exposed and are um, seropositive for some, but not the others. So, you know, AAV for gene therapy of hemophilia goes back, um, you know, 25 years. In the early trials, um, investigators actually injected AAV carrying a corrective gene for hemophilia B, in other words, a factor nine gene into muscle, because it was known that these vectors transduce muscle very well. However, a hemophiliac getting many, many injections into the muscle, needing a lot of factor um, prophylaxis in order to do that was really not ideal. And it also turned out that the levels that you that were generated by these muscle injections were low and very transient, and there's no positive clinical effect. So the first trial that was a little more encouraging involved vascular intravenous delivery to the liver. And this shows here in, the, in a patient in, one of the, in this trial in 1996, um, that in red factor nine went up at two to four weeks. And then unfortunately beginning at six weeks dropped back towards baseline. And this is coincident with evidence of liver inflammation with the ALT and AST transaminases going up just as the um, factor nine levels fell. And it's been shown that this was due to an anti-AAV2 capsid T cell response and antibody response that basically destroyed the liver cells that contained um, the uh, episomal vector. You know, just the capsid of AAV2 was carried in with the vector and stimulated enough of the immune system um, to reject um, transduced hepatocytes. So it took about another 10 years, but basically a number of advances were made that were able to get around this issue. First of all, an AAV8 instead of AAV2 strain was used, and many fewer humans are actually seropositive for AAV8. It also has greatly increased liver tropism, and therefore much lower doses could be given intravenously, and it seemed to be less likely to stimulate immune rejection. The other thing that was done in these uh, two patients shown here is as soon as the ALT started to go up, they were treated with a tapering dose of prednisone. And this allowed in the two patients shown here and indeed in the other patients in the trial, stabilization of the factor nine level and normalization of the liver enzymes. And over here on the right, we see the number of bleeding episodes per year in patients before gene transfer and in patients after gene transfer. And there was really a significant drop in bleeding episodes, as well as a significant decrease or um, complete lack of needing a factor nine infusions any longer after gene therapy. Another approach that's been taken is to actually deliver a hyperactive uh, variant of factor nine, factor nine Padua. This is a natural mutation, a natural variant that has eight times greater specific activity per molecule. So you could give a hundred fold lower doses of AAV to get the same factor nine activity 
leads to a much less potent immune response. It's also cheaper, more uh, simpler manufacturing because you can give so much lower doses. And this shows a factor IX activity over time as published in the New England Journal. And the bleeding rate basically drops way down or disappears after gene therapy and the level of factor IX infusion. So this has been also very successful and was uh, run by a biotech company called Spark. Um, so the uh, FDA submission um, from Spark for factor IX hemophilia B is ongoing and negotiating with the FDA about approval for factor VIII gene therapy. Um, BioMarin is um, the biotech company that has developed factor VIII gene therapy the furthest. I did, didn't show that data today, but it's quite similar to the factor IX data. Um, but the FDA submission from last year, uh, the FDA is requiring two years of follow-up of the phase three cohort to prove that the level of uh, factor eight doesn't fall over time. There was some concern in the later time points that maybe there was a slight diminution in factor eight levels. The other challenge has been that to treating children. Now an episomal vector such as AAV would not be effective because it doesn't integrate into the target hepatocytes. And as the child grows, as the liver goes from, you know, maybe the size of a ping pong ball in an infant to the size of a football in an adult, um, it would be diluted out and you would have to do multiple treatments, which is not feasible in terms of immune rejection. So people are looking at integrating lentiviruses that are targeting the liver, as well as gene editing um, with CRISPR-Cas targeting the factor VIII gene directly in liver cells. And I'll talk a little bit more about gene editing in a minute. I would like to point out that the, uh, the first US FDA approved gene therapy uses an AAV vector to directly deliver the injection into the retina to treat a uh, type of retinal blindness due to um, mutations in the RPE65 gene. And this um, has been you know, kind of amazingly uh, effective in these patients who otherwise um, become blind um, early in life. It's a one-time treatment. And obviously um, you know, it's very expensive, but you're you know, uh, basically preventing a patient from going blind. Um, and this uh, company Spark was bought, bought by Roche for 4 billion several years ago. They obviously think this and the other treatments that Spark is developing um, with AV vectors are very um, encouraging. So finally, I'm gonna talk about perhaps the future of gene therapies, and that is likely targeted gene therapies such as gene editing. Because as I've shown you, there are issues um, with both integrating lentiviruses in terms of genotoxicity and AAV um, in vivo gene therapies due to potential um, episomal loss with cell divisions. Now, there are a number of different um, nuclease-based gene editing systems, including zinc finger nucleases and tailins, but by far the most common system now, and by far the simplest, involves CRISPR-Cas9. And I'm sure you've all read about uh, CRISPR approaches, and it contains two um, components. One is a bacterial nuclease, the Cas9 bacterial nuclease, originally derived from Streptococcus or Staph aureus. Now other types of Cas's have been utilized as well. Um, this protein binds to what's called a guide RNA that is designed to be homologous to your target site of interest. So this complex binds to DNA at a site homologous to the guide and the nuclease cuts specifically at this site. It makes a double-stranded break and then two things can happen. If there is no uh, corrective DNA template present, the cell undergoes what's called non-homologous end joining to repair the double standard break. And that repair process results in small insertions or deletions that generally would knock out the function of a genetic locus or knock out a gene. So non-homologous end joining isn't gene correction, it's just another way to do gene knockout, which may be very useful as you've seen for specific gene therapy applications. Now, if you also deliver a template that is homologous to the site where you have your double-stranded break, you can have a process called homology-directed repair actually repair the mutation by inserting the donor DNA at the cup cut site to replace um, your mutated DNA or replacing the DNA at the site that you would like to uh, insert your uh, new DNA at. Now, I just want to quickly compare lentiviral gene addition versus nuclease-mediated editing. In green are the advantages. So obviously, nuclease-mediated editing is targeted. Lentiviral gene addition is semi-random, as I've told you. 
both have possibilities of genotoxicity, which are low but finite with lentiviruses, but we don't know a lot yet about the potential for off-target editing that can be genotoxic using um, CRISPR-Cas uh, systems. Efficiency is very high now with lentiviral gene addition and many cell types, including hematopoietic stem cells and T cells. And nuclease-mediated editing is quite good for non-homologous end joining if you wanna knock a locus out, but it's way lower for gene correction by HDR. And that requires quite a lot more research to become efficient enough to apply in patients. The toxicity of the process is very low to hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, but quite a bit higher from nuclease mediated editing because you actually have to shock the cells with electricity to get them to take up the complexes as well as double-stranded DNA breaks being very toxic to the target cells, especially hematopoietic stem cells. The cost and complexity eventually will be lower for gene editing because you're just delivering um, synthesized mRNA and proteins. You don't have a complex viral system. And applications, the exciting thing about gene editing is the ability to work on dominant diseases because you can actually replace the mutation. You know, we have over 10 years of data from lentiviral gene therapy trials targeting hematopoietic stem cells. So, you know, the data is not perfect, but at least we understand and have long-term follow-up. Whereas nuclease mediated editing is just beginning first in human clinical trials. So we really need to follow these patients for much longer to know, um, you know, how it's going to work over time. And therefore it becomes very difficult to decide which of these two methodologies to um, pursue for diseases where both are feasible. So in terms of gene editing for hemoglobinopathies, it's really astounding that within basically seven years of CRISPR-Cas systems first being described in 2012 and 2013 by Jennifer Doudna, Emmanuel Charpentier, and others winning uh, Jen and Emanuele the Nobel Prize uh, last year, it's already in clinical trials. And this is the first paper. Um, and it was, again, applying um, uh, gene editing specifically to gene therapy for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. And they took advantage of the fact that during hemoglobin switching, when we turn off fetal hemoglobin, the gamma chain, and replace it with the adult beta chain occurring just around the time of birth, that it turns out a transcription factor called BCL11A is responsible for shutting off fetal hemoglobin and turning on beta hemoglobin. So you can actually target a, a control region for the BCL11A gene, the erythroid enhancer, with a CRISPR-Cas complex with a guide RNA that targets this enhancer region and basically knocks it out, makes it non-functional, turns off BCL11A um, expression in erythroid cells, and therefore turns back on fetal hemoglobin in order to treat uh, sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia. And this shows patient one with thalassemia, pre-gene um, therapy, the patient was all hemoglobin A and was fully transfused. After gene therapy, the patient began making lots of endogenous hemoglobin F and went off transfusion, as I'll show you in the next slide. This patient too with sickle cell disease, um, basically was also being fully transfused at the time of gene therapy, and over time began making a large percentage of fetal hemoglobin, shown here in blue, as well as still having um, about half endogenous sickle globin. But this degree of collection, correction was uh, sufficient um, to uh, overcome the phenotype. Shown here for the sickle cell patient in red were for the 2.5 years before gene therapy, the number of vaso-occlusive crises post um, gene therapy, basically none. And here is the number of transfusions before gene therapy, gene editing, and here is none post uh, infusion of the cells. In thalassemia, this patient wasn't having crises obviously, but was transfusion dependent before receiving the gene editing therapy. And then post, uh, post uh, infusion, the patient is no longer needing transfusions. Um, this is only two patients, but the work was um, updated at ASH and ASGCT this past year and has shown that this approach has been um, successful in an additional cohort of patients. I believe up to eight have been reported so far. So it's very, very exciting. So where are we at this point with uh, gene therapies for hematopoietic and hematologic disorders? 
you know, as I've mentioned already, it's a little, there's so many different approaches, some which I haven't even mentioned, like base editing and prime editing, which are approaches to gene editing that don't result in double-stranded DNA breaks. It's hard to know when you're a biotech company or a clinical investigator, which to pursue, because it takes, you know, several years at least to get into clinical trials. And it's, you know, before we have full information on the long-term outcomes of these patients, it's very hard to decide which approach is best. How do we pay for these one-time extremely expensive interventions that are nonetheless expected to potentially cure the patient and therefore save money? Um, for instance, saving money spent over the lifetime of a uh, hemophilia patient for uh, factor eight or factor nine infusions, you know, millions and millions of dollars um, spent for hospitalizations of patients with sickle cell disease. Um, and even in our healthcare system, a high resource system, it's been very hard to figure this out. And it's even more challenging in terms of trying to translate these therapies to patients um, in lower resource countries. For instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the vast majority of patients with sickle cell disease live. And the Gates Foundation and um, the NIH are working very hard on coming up with um, non-transplant in vivo um, gene therapies to treat these patients in a way that wouldn't require an ablative transplant um, and ex vivo collection and transduction of cells. So I thank you for your attention. This is a picture of where I work uh, at the NIH Clinical Research Center. Uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, in the United States. Um, we'd love to have you come visit um, once COVID is under more control and uh, you know, talk to me more about uh, gene and cell therapies for blood diseases. Uh, thank you very much.